Hey, one more thing before you go. Hungary, 1944. Almost a half a million Jewish Hungarians are deported to Auschwitz. Among the few surviving Hungarian Jews from this era were young men who were forced into brutal labor service where they were cut off from the outside of the world and forced to endure inhumane brutalities in servitude. In this episode, we have a truly remarkable tale that transcends time and generation. Dr. Robert Wolf shares the epic journey of his family, a story of resilience, courage, and the indomitable human spirit. Stories of fleeing from communist Hungary, the father's tragic history of escaping the Nazis not once but twice, and having his own parents deported to Auschwitz. We're going to learn what inspired Robert to document these harrowing tales and share those stories, but we have a documentation of a historical event that needs to be told. Robert Wolf grew up as the only child of Irvin and Judith Wolf. It was their stories of fleeing from communist Hungary, his father's history of escaping the Nazis twice, having his own parents deported Auschwitz, inspired Robert to document these harrowing tales and to share these stories with Jewish groups and others around the United States. He's been featured in national media and local TV, including ABC, NBC, Fox, CBS, and more. In his book, Not a Real Enemy, The True Story of a Hungarian Jewish Man's Fight for Freedom, he shares his family's saga and the forgotten history of the nearly half a million Hungarian Jews who were deported and or killed during the Holocaust through an epic and inspiring tale of daring escapes, terrifying oppression, tragedy, and triumph. Welcome to the show, Robert. Hi, thanks for having me, Michael. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Your family's had uh, had a journey, hadn't it? <laughs> Journey's not even the word. It's, it's unbelievable. So, um, yeah, well, appreciate that uh, summary. That uh, I recognize some of that summary, and it's uh, it's really quite accurate. Uh, I was just motivated to write this book about my father after I discovered his autobiography that they wrote back in the 1970s. Uh, I guess we could. The book is called "Not a Real Enemy: uh, The True Story of a Hungarian Jewish Man's Fight for Freedom," and it's just that. Uh, my dad, uh, as you'd said, he was a four-time escape artist. He escaped twice uh, in Nazi Hungary from forced labor camps, once out in the middle of nowhere with his friend Frank, once in Budapest, right out of the dog pound, right in front of uh, Nazi headquarters in Budapest, another harrowing and miraculous split-second timing type of escape with his friend Frank, and uh, in fact, cigarettes in that case probably saved their lives. And uh, my dad had a, an illness, so there are some lot of paradoxes that are hidden in the story, but my dad had a, a, an ill, he had food poisoning and a foot infection while he was out in the, in the foothills in the Caspian Mountains while the, in forced labor camp. And so he was uh, allowed to go to a hospital, and that might have saved his life too, because when he got back to the, to the uh, labor camp and they were already marching, he and his friend Frank thought that was a death, death, march, death march. So that was their first escape. So first of four, the first two with his friend Frank, and I'm still in touch with Frank's daughter. They're out in California. Uh, very nice people, big family, and uh, hopefully I will re re reunite with her again someday. Oh, that would be very cool. Yeah, that would be very cool. I mean, what an amazing journey that you were able to document from that perspective. I think we lose so stories. So then yeah. after, so then it wasn't better for the, com the communists won. Of course, the communists won in, in Hungary and Eastern Europe. If the United States, uh, and this comes up from time to time, if the United States had taken over Hungary instead of the Russians, we wouldn't be here having this conversation. I, I'd probably be living in Hungary uh, and uh, hopefully a democratic nation for the last 50, 60, 7 years. But it's been anything but. Yeah. Uh, a little bit turbulent now, as you know. And uh, so my dad escaped uh, again as a medical student, turned around and went back. Uh, we've got cloak and dagger stories. We have arguing with armed Russian soldiers. We've got hiding places that you wouldn't expect. And this isn't just in the communist era. This is in the Nazi era, of course, as well. And, uh, and then finally they escaped in 1956 after the Hungarian Revolution. That was about a two and a half week war. About 3,000 people died. Uh, early on in the Ukraine war, that was compared to the Hungarian Revolution because uh, they, they talked about American apathy back then. So, but we didn't have the type of communication back then that we do now. And uh, of course the weaponry and the population of the United States and Europe and everything. So it's more than just, oh, we've been invaded. Let's just go intervene. It's not that simple because uh, governments have a, a responsibility to protect their own people as much as help other people's other people around the country including mm -hmm. israel and ukraine and i'm all for the support and i would go to israel now if i could i, I was just there about a year ago and it's i never felt safer and i didn't want to come back and i live in florida so it was that beautiful but uh, not to not to digress so the hungarian the the true story of a hungarian jewish man's fight for freedom i'll show you the 
I may as well talk about this. The um, book cover, we, the official book cover only has one seal, but we've won four awards now. And I don't even know what to do with that. I don't really have time to sit back and, you know, sit on my laurels and say, this is so amazing and just do one of these. And because it, it means that somebody's recognizing the quality and the importance of our work, uh, especially now and today. So that that's that's the announcement with that. And um, hopefully another, that was, I like oh, to, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> I want a little bit. I want you to know a little bit more about you and your story and how you got to find all this stuff and and how you got to where you're at. If you don't mind, where did you grow up? Okay, I was born. Uh, well, my parents are both from Hungary. My dad was from Jur, a small town in Hungary. Mom was from Budapest. Like I said, they came over in '56. More harrowing story. That would be uh, sort of a part two book. Uh, I, I drew the book off his autobiography, which I'll come back to in just a minute. But uh, born and raised in the Detroit area. Uh, went to Tufts University in near Boston. Uh, very fortunate. Uh, then my, my parents, my dad actually took me to my University of Michigan medical school interview when I was a senior uh, at Tufts, and I got in early decision. So I was fortunate enough to go into U, to go to U of M, which was a top time, top ten medical school at the time. Um, and then I did a radiology residency at, at, at Brown University, and I did a neuroradiology fellowship at Yale. So I've lived half my life in Michigan, half my life in New England, and here I am, thirty years old by now, and I've been an indentured servant long enough. So I started working as a radiologist, and I've been in radiology for about 35 years now. Uh, I've been working part-time since I was 43, and I'm now 61. I'm still working very part-time doing x-ray and ultrasound. So that'll bring me to the book now. So my dad and mom wrote the autobiography in the 70s. They uh, pencil and paper to typewriter to computer, and they wrote the stories as though they'd happened the, the previous day. They were very sharp. They were very lucid. They, they had great memories. They were Holocaust educators, history educators. They were very diverse people, uh, art and music, opera, travel, education. So they were, they were not uh, one-dimensional. Um, so finally, the paper, the, the, the book gets onto a manuscript. I probably read it once, maybe when I was in my 30s, and really didn't think much about it. I did remember his first escape, but most of the rest of the book I didn't really remember. And then, so I have a career and a family, and then uh, my dad dies in 1997, unfortunately, and then my mom in 2016, and uh, spent about a year taking care of mom's affairs, and then I re decided to retire for a year. And then a friend of mine, uh, who I was a partner with but way back in the day out of Michigan, said, I need help. Can you help me with some x-rays and ultrasounds a couple days a week? So I did. Uh, I was living in Massachusetts at the time, working from home. And uh, that brought me to the book. Uh, the book was, is, is now in a disc. Uh, and actually, after my mom passed away in 2016, a historian friend from their hometown handed me the disc and said, you know, you really have to read that. And uh, I did a recent book talk in my hometown at the library, and she was there, and uh, it was really well received. But so uh, that was now 2018, 2019. Wrote the book, uh, tried to query it. It was just sort of a boring biography, point A to B to C. Uh, asked some uh, beta readers to review the book. One of them, uh, Elisa Tenner from Rhode Island, very nice. Uh, also a book coach gets me Janice Harper, who's my co-author. So she took another year and change of uh, writing the book. Did, did her homework, the history, the culture, the music, called historians, as I did too when I first did my version of it. So, And she turned the book into a real novel, uh, parallel stories, converging stories, conversations, letters to and from home, lots of twists and turns, and uh, we wouldn't be here probably with the awards and the and all the accolades if it weren't for her because she's a very, very excellent can, professional can I, writer. You, can I back you up just for a second sure. because I think we overlapped on something. Um, when you talk about the the book, we were talking about your parents and, the, and your inspiration for getting the book. So, the help us help me understand again. You all of their information, the stuff that, that their autobiography that they had, was that published prior to your book, or was that just autobiography that was written and documented, and you took all that stuff and, and kind of delved into it to get to where you wrote the book? I couldn't say it better myself. That's exactly what happened. It was, it was their own personal keepsake, and I, I think it was because they knew back then, and I hate it when my parents are right, that I would do this. They knew that if I ever read my dad's story and really absorbed it and thought about it, and so it was a, it was a self-motivating thing. Once I read the story and all the escapes and other many other miracles, not just the escapes, uh, my dad even missed an escape. He went to the wrong train station, and everybody who made that train uh, got arrested, including his medical school roommate. So there's another story. So he misses one, and, and he, it's a big, you know, so 
but uh, it, the motivation was there because you could see their anti-Semitism is in the backdrop throughout the throughout the uh, book, throughout the story. Uh, the Hungarians were afraid of whoever was in charge, even after World War One. Uh, there was the uh, the red uh, the red terror. There was the white terror. There was Horthy. They didn't know, and the Jews just felt no matter who was around, no matter whoever was in charge, they were getting a bad shake, and it was true. So the communists were not much better to the Jews than than the Nazis, short of corralling them in ghettos and put, you know, putting them on trains and, and executing them. So, but they were not you know, Jewish. Go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. As a child, did you um, happen to, I mean, did your father tell you these stories? Did your mother tell you any of these stories before they were written them down? Very little, unless uh, there was an argument or something, and my dad would give me the spoiled American argument and you know, what it was like in forced labor camps, you know, starving and this and that. And, um, you know, I'm immature. I mean, I'm a college kid. I'm a high school kid, college kid, focused on, you know, you're, you're studying hours and hours a day. You, you really don't have time to, to sit and reminisce about it. But they did educate all their friends and, and family. They hooked up with many, many people around the world, uh, Eastern European and otherwise, they had Indian friends, Asian friends, African American, Philippine, uh, uh, everywhere in the world, um, and I'm the same way. Actually, not to, quite to their degree because they travel a lot more than I do, and maybe I will someday again. But uh, th so yes, they shared with me slowly. But the second half of my life, even more so. So the stories came out more and more. Uh, Mom liked to share the stories with uh, relatives and my wife and and all that. And and uh, it's too bad she didn't chronicle more of what happened to her during the during the war, as my dad did. But obviously, she's in the second half of the book because they got married. Uh, well, and I think that, you know, we as, in general, I helped an individual from uh, World War II. He actually was at, um, he was actually at Iwo Jima and when he was 17 years old. He lied to get into the, um, in the Navy. And uh, when they realized he was only 17 years old, he was already on the ship and it was already outside Iwo Jima. So they kind of went, well, you're here, so you're going to work. <laughs> And uh, he ended up shooting down two Japanese zeros when he wasn't supposed to. So he got a pat on the back on the ship, but reprimanded outside the ship because he wasn't supposed to be up on there shooting down Japanese zeros. And to me, it, as an individual, obviously, I love history anyway, but to me, it was an opportunity to get history from a, a, from a personal perspective, a history from somebody's mouth that lived it. And helping him tell that story he was documenting it for the same reason. He wanted to give his autobiography to his kids and to his grandkids and kind of share that story from that perspective. And then once he did, he started realizing that maybe this needs to go a little farther and a little wider from you know a larger audience, so to speak, other than just family, friends, and, and colleagues and things like that. Um, when did you? What point did you recognize that this story that they told and these stories that they collected? was something that needed to be more worldwide than it does than it did to be household? That's such a great question. I love that you mentioned uh, uh, Okina. You didn't say Oka, dude. You said Iwo Jima, yeah, right? I, now, Iwo Jima. Uh, well, because in World War II in general, and never mind the Hungarian Re Revolution, which very few people know about, but during World War II, everybody knows about London, Germany, Poland even, uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, Okinawa, Japan, but mm -hmm. nobody really knows about Lithuania or... The Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic, Romania, Hungary, uh, the anatomy, I could, as a radiologist, call it the anatomy, but it's the geography changed right. so much, you needed a program just to keep up with it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it just, uh, it, I got zapped. I mean, I guess it, when my mom passed and I started going back to work uh, as a radiologist, left side is the cue, the list of the patients, right side of the images. And the left side was my dad's autobiography and the right side was me dictating essentially his whole biography. And I got, you know, I was doing two pages a day, then three, then 10 and 20. I, I was just so, I was so enthralled with it. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't walk away. I had to walk away from time to time. Like when my dad's parents were taken off to Auschwitz and uh, eyewitness testimony to what actually happened to them. And uh, then I really had to walk away for about a week or so uh, from the project and say, yeah, I just had to really absorb. And these are the grandparents I never met. Uh, mm -hmm. You Holocaust deniers out there, it, it happened. If Dad said that that's what happened, then that's what happened. And we've got a lot of documentation. documentation. Even the Nazis documented everything. They, yeah. they took photographs and they sent them home to, to, to the families, and this is what we're doing. So if the Nazis aren't going to deny the Holocaust, then why should people 50, 60, 70 years later? Well, and, the, the uh, ones that were rescued, actually, there's video of them rescuing these individuals that were emaciated and in those the horrific living conditions. And absolutely. So starvation, yeah, starvation, yeah. persecution, torture, 
uh, I mean, the stories are on. It. It's, on, it's so hard to believe. But the other sad thing, I mean, it resonates well with today, the human nature, how can we treat each other so badly and think of so many different methods of doing it, whether it's poison, whether it's stabbings or shootings or hanging people by their thumbs in, in some cases, uh, crazy things like having to climb up hills uh, in a frog position. Uh, you know, you see Rocky doing this kind of stuff, not uh, not normal human beings, just it just and stupid tasks that are so uh, menial and so mindless that they, they're just making them do it just to just to have power and just to, to waste time. And, and it's, it's really it's ridiculous. I mean, it's so counterproductive. And then uh, so finally, my mom and dad had enough of it. They they were they wanted to be free. They wanted to both practice medicine. Mom was 13 months away from graduating medical school, by the way, when they left in 56, and she never got to go back. Uh, they end up in Boston, and mom had to work doing research. So dad finally got a residency at the esteemed Beth Israel. It's a Harvard affiliate. I couldn't get in there in any sub any specialty, but became an OBGYN, ended up going to Detroit, of course, and uh, ended up delivering over 10,000 babies in a shortened career. And that's really the punchline. That's the redemption of it, is the, what he gave back to the world. And their personalities, who's so jolly and jovial, no sign of PTSD. Uh, just uh, you would never know what he had gone through, the way he was in the world. And that was so warming, how heartwarming when I go back to my hometown and I did a, a, a talk in front of eight, sold out 80 people in the library and sold all the books. And people that come up to me and say, I remember, yeah, your dad delivered a couple of my kids or your dad delivered three of my kids. And it's so heartwarming that they said, they say, boy, we didn't know anything about uh, and people said, "Well, I wish you knew your par I knew, wish I knew your parents better back in the day." And I guess, re in retrospect, uh, same with me. I wish I maybe pursued pursued this a little earlier, so my parents could uh, actually maybe help me along with the details. But it was pretty detailed the way they chronicled it. But I can hear my mom now with her Hungarian accent saying, "You couldn't do this while we were still alive." <laughs> that is, oh, you've only won four awards. Only four. You couldn't do better. <laughs> Yeah. She was a little bit of a helicopter mom. She had a she had a, a touch of PTSD, but she handled it well by educating. You know, they were active in the medical community and the Jewish community. She was president of her ort. Uh, she, they were very they were busy, and and so they they got they fought through it. And not a lot of people could. I, yeah. I mean, a, lot of, a lot of people read this book and say, I don't know how I could survive. And people put themselves in my dad's place, and and that's kind of what happened to me with that zap. Uh, that you, you actually empathize with my father and, and his family. And you said, this could be me. And it's, it's sad, even in the United States, you know, uh, natural disaster, uh, war, uh, bad local government, uh, bad business, deal, bad federal government, bad foreign government. You could be on the run, homeless, starving, and uh, less than desirable conditions. And a lot of it was that. It was very harrowing in the book. So very, very self-motivating to, to do this book. I mean, how could I, and just to answer your question, how can I leave that on, on a disc or on a mm. computer screen? It has to be shared. I mean, and uh, or even, I mean, I'm getting greedy now, I guess, but I thought, well, if a hundred people read the book, if a thousand people read the book, that's a thousand people, 10,000 read the, read the book, that's 10,000 people that will hear about my dad's story. And, and hopefully it changes their attitude about what's going on today because it sure changed mine. And so far, many others, which uh, that's the that, that is really the most gratifying thing about it is to getting people to change their mind about racism, anti-Semitism, humanity. Well, and you, you know, you you experiencing it firsthand. I mean, from your through your parents, vicariously through your parents, you experienced this in a different way because it was personal to you. You had family members that actually were affected by it. And actually, you know, I'm assuming your grandparents obviously didn't make it out, unfortunately. But your parents almost didn't make it out. So to you, this is a personal journey. And I respect that because in reality, the individuals, I unfortunately see, and, and, and I, have to, I have to be careful, I, I see us backtracking to a point in today's society. And I think that you know there are certain factions who are trying to cover history and state that this history didn't happen in many different arenas that history didn't happen that way or history didn't take place that way or they're trying to cover it up and smooth over what exists in history at the moment. So presenting a book like this and telling the story from your parents and everything that happened to them and, and, hit, and your father's parents, realistically, you're giving back to the world from that perspective. So thank you for doing that because I believe that you're carrying forward a message that the reality of what humanity has done to people in what humanity has walked away from needs to be told. 
again and again. People, some of these kids protesting in the college, they don't even know what 9-11 is and they're denying 9-11. But let's, let's remind you children that 9-11 was American targets, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, yeah. Asian. I mean, a lot of people yeah. got killed in that and, and also the aftermath and the, the uh, collateral from that. So, and then there's October 7th, uh, October 7th, 8th, depending on what part of the world you were in, uh, another disaster. I mean, and that, that's ongoing. And then our slippery slope fighting anti-Semitism just went from this to this because yeah. you know, now I'm trying to climb up an icy rock with, with one pickaxe and nothing else because uh, there's just more people that uh, we have to convince that hate is not the way is not the right way. Murder, hate, yeah, rape, exactly. torture. It's not. It, it keeps happening. And let's let's move along. Let, let's we're we're human beings here. We're not. Uh, we're the worst species. I mean, we're the only ones yeah. with you know maybe black widows and certain species of snakes and other. But humans, just, we're the only ones really. We can be really right, flat need out more evil. More team play. I mean, so uh, <coughs> can be right out evil. No remorse, and that's not, uh, it's just not right. I mean, it's unacceptable. It's not, it's not necessary. It is uh, not. You know, I, I it, live my own life. I, I've got three generations. My dad's dad was a, a dentist, and, you know, he got murdered. He was a captain on a ship in World War One on a Red Cross ship. You know, so yeah, these people <coughs> contributed to society, and so did their friends. So it's not like uh, you, we're not uh, people that are just sort of uh, hanging around and, and uh, committing crimes and, and malfeasance. It's, these are productive, educated, human uh, beings. kind yeah, exactly. Human beings, plain and simple. Um, do you have any brothers or sisters? I don't, actually. It's a great question. Only child of only children. So this is my legacy to my family. I'm giving back to my family and actually to the Jewish religion, I would say, because I'm not really that orthodox. I do observe Passover and Yom Kippur, and I pray every Saturday, uh, but I'm not the I'm not the highest tier. of. Uh, but uh, I'm getting a lot of interest in uh, by hopefully more orthodox Jews and and, and non not even just Jewish. I mean, of course, I have more Christian right. friends, Jewish friends. I'm my, one of my best friends is Muslim. I mean, I'm not, they all get the message. So, but uh, there are, there's lessons about orthodox shunning the non-orthodox in forced labor camp, wherein they were all in the same boat. They were all You're slave all, laborers. Exactly. And all, and I, 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 don't, I'm, I, hate the, I hate discussing that with the orthodox because well. I say, well, you just, but I'm not blaming all the orthodox. I'm just saying this is an attitude that was, that was prevalent then that I don't think is right. If we're in this, if we're on the same team, let's be on the same team. And uh, dad got shunned. His family got shunned because they were in the wrong neighborhood back even before the war. And they didn't know where to live, which country to live in for their survival. And, and some of their decisions, unfortunately, ended up being ill-fated, at least for my dad's parents. Also, um, the fortunate thing about my dad's parents, they weren't there long, too long. You know, they didn't have to suffer for long periods of time, which is, I mean, if you're going to kill me, just kill me now because who wants to be starving or... You know, sick, ill, freezing, tortured for months at a time. Nobody does. I mean, that's mm -hmm. not uh, even now with the uh, refugees. Of course, uh, slowly they're re they're releasing them. So, um, no, it's uh, it's just uh, it's crazy. I, I mean, it's just uh, also my dad's grand or my mom's. So my mom didn't chronicle as much. I think she was luckier. She was with her mom and grandmother hiding out in farmland, pretty much uh, out of the out of the uh, out of harm's way for the most part. So she didn't really chronicle too much. She was trying to get more of her genealogy going back, but she did find out her uh, her uh, grandfather, a rabbi, was also, he also perished at Auschwitz. So uh, at least three from my family that they know about. Uh, mom and dad were both only children, I might have mentioned. So uh, I've been married and uh, I do have two beautiful stepdaughters and three beautiful step grandkids, and they're all around the country. Two of them have visited the Holocaust Museum and they, they mm. flashed the picture of them holding the book. And you know how that makes you, I mean, it makes you cry. I mean, it's just, it's so, it's so warming. They go tell the staff about, uh, about the, uh, about me and the book. And it's just so wonderful. And those grandkids are the ones that are going to be educating their grandkids yeah. if they keep it going. And that's, what's so important about this book is keep, I want the book to be taught in the classroom. Uh, maybe not junior high, but junior high schoolers can listen to my speech and uh, maybe we've got a shortened version, but certainly college, uh, yeshiva, uh, you know, uh, history classes, uh, high school and summer reading, whatever. Uh, so education is the big thing. The link to the Holocaust Museum, I got to say two quick things about that. One is I'm giving 10% of my author proceeds donating to the Holocaust Museum for the rest of my life and even posthumously. So that's that's in my trust. I hope the grandkids carry that out. Uh, they probably won't have a choice because I have an excellent uh, trust attorney. And uh, I'm going, to, I've been invited to go do a two day book signing at the Holocaust Museum in April, which is such a, that's like the pinnacle of what we do. So I'm so blessed and, and, uh, it's a great honor. I, you know, that's another, 
I could sit there all day and cry about that, and, and believe me, I do. But uh, it's it's just it's such an honor to be able to do that, and and I'm doing Houston Holocaust Museum next month, and I'm in talks with Michigan, my home state, and Orange County. I did an Illinois presentation, which was really well received. So, you know, I'm not afraid to fly. I'm putting my neck out there, as you know, because there's a lot of haters still, and uh, you know, I'm 61. It's the books out, so you want to damage me? Try, but. Uh, I ain't scared. Well, I mean, realistically, you're honoring your parents and your family legacy, your parents and your grandparents and everybody that has survived through that and the other ones that have perished through that. You are bringing a, the word to the modern public. So, you know, that is an honor, I think. You're carrying something on and the Holocaust Museum needs to... I, I mean, I know they do a great job with what they're doing with getting education out and getting people um, ha to a better understanding of what took place and the the nature of what took place. And, and when I say this, I was coming out of your mouth is, is something that came out of your parents' mouth who experienced it firsthand. And I think that's what's the magic. I mean, if I could say magic, but that's what the secret sauce is to to this particular story is because they're they're told from their perspective. They're told from the individuals that actually experienced it. So you're getting you're getting the, it's not carried down, you know, generation to generation because it's like telephone. You start carrying it down to generation generation, you're going to lose, you know, some parts of it or some parts may get changed. But in this particular case, you had the unique opportunity of being able to take the documentation that they did and expand upon it further, which I think is a really cool thing to do. Um, yeah, the Holocaust, the museums are all beautiful. They're well-designed. They've got a lot of meaning and power, but it is, it's a, pay, a paper and pencil or it's a, a drawing or a piece of art, whereas people talking about it and, and relating the stories uh, to other people, it, it has a certain power to it that uh, yeah. uh, that's, uh, that's really means a lot, too. So, um, yeah, And I do a lot of book talks around here in Florida, too. I'll, I'll, sh I'll schlep all over. I'll go anywhere, really. I mean, I'm not, I don't say no to anything. But whether it's five people at the talk, 10 people, 50, 100, I'll do it. I mean, it's, if it changes people, then we get to help spread the word. And, uh, and then people ask, well, how do we, how do we uh, help fight anti-Semitism? Anti well, we already talked about it. Come to these lectures. Tell other people about the book and, and other books like mine. Uh, Amsterdam Publishers, my publishing company, Outstanding. Uh, she took us literally bottom of the ninth, uh, shoestring catch, last query, and she took us. And this is all she does is Holocaust related. She's putting about two, three books out a month. Many, many great books, and we need and and so let's say the hate crime uh, perpetrators of hate crimes in the classroom, and um, people are doing videos in prisons. Even I mean uh, th those kind of things. So so the educating uh, educating is in as many avenues as we can is, is the way to go. And and I guess that's kind of my charge now, if if you will. That's uh, that's where I'm at. I got the zap. Thanks a lot, mom and dad. But uh, it makes me feel better. I could still be doing full time radiology and making oodles of money and all that, but. Uh, you know, there's burnout and everything. There's more to life than food, shelter, and clothing. Uh, there's the lessons of life, uh, love, family, and uh, people that, uh, that's another lesson. If you have family, you, you don't quite get along, uh, try try to change things that way. Or if you're bored and you're looking for a pivot, do something different with your life. Go back to part-time, get a second job, write a book, a play, an opera, uh, go to a ball game, a concert, take a day off, whatever. Um, you know what I'm saying. I'm just... Uh, accountability is important and when people start blaming other people for their for their issues they need to pivot they need to look at themselves and say well, well what am i why can't i do something better and i think that's what i did it's, it's, uh, with this book it's probably the most important thing i'll ever do in my life uh maybe not but it's a if it certainly is a feel-good thing i've worked with charities and and uh, fundraisers and all that and that's a great feeling is raising money and uh, for for kids uh, with cancer for example that you don't even know uh, but and then of course I helped radiol. I've done thousands and thousands of studies in a, as a radiologist over the years. So I've helped a lot of people, but I'm compensated for that. But the book, uh, not so much. But like I said, 10% goes to the Holocaust Museum, another form of education, and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll sell a lot of books and, and get the message out. Yeah, and in that whole arena, I think that it, the, the well, well, yeah, the summer here is getting. Last year was really, really hot here. Um, broke records, actually, unfortunately. But I've enjoyed here because growing up in Colorado, 8,500 feet up behind Pikes Peak, I mean, we literally, our front yard was the backside of Pikes Peak. You know, we'd get snow in October, and then it would stay there until May. 
um, sometimes into June. So coming there to here, I'm done we with go. That. Oh, it was huge. <laughs> I'll snowbird if I ever, you know, if I ever reconcile. But I, that's another. That's my my social situation. But right now, I'm I'm full time doing this. So uh, 10, 12, 14 hour days in many cases. So well, and and you're but you're doing a good thing. So here, let's get back on. It means much. So, had you ever had you thought at any point in your career or your life that you were would ever write a book? Great question. Five years ago, if you knew me. If you knew me five years ago and you say, no way is this guy ever going to write a book about the Holocaust and his parents, because I, I think I got a little Holocaust uh, fatigue, Holocaust saturation from my mom myself, because I heard, I started hearing the stories again and again, and uh, it, it, to me, it was a little bit morbid. I mean, truth, the truth is people don't want to hear about death and dying and yeah. torture, and, and it, I mean, you can get saturated with it, but uh, people that knew my mom and they, they, they loved it, I mean, but they weren't hearing it as much as me. So you'd never think... But like I said, they, they wrote this as though they knew I was going to convert it. And uh, I know it sounds corny, but uh, I think that disc called out to me like Superman's kryptonite. That's kind of the best That's the best analogy I can come up with. It just sort of summoned me. And, and, and then I got the zap. Like, uh, and no, I, and, but I did write. I mean, we wrote in high school. We wrote the sports column in high school. And I wrote a little bit in college for the, for the Tufts paper. And then... Uh, we had to write some papers while I was a resident. So, and fortunately, I, my attending was an excellent uh, writer of art, you know, uh, radiology articles. So, uh, we did a an article that got me to go to three meetings, three radiology meetings. And there's nothing like going to a weeks long radiology meeting and not having to do night call on weekends and having a blast. So, we really milked that out. So, I guess in that way, I'm a writer, but it was always with guidance. And but uh, the truth of the matter is, I still had guidance because of my excellent co-author Janice and and uh, with her her help and coaching and helping me rewrite the book and, uh, and querying uh, authors and, uh, and uh, publishers that uh, I, I do. That's another lesson. Get help. You know, that's uh, don't, if people try to fight it themselves and do something by themselves. If you want to play tennis as a pro, let's say that's a, let's, we'll call that an individual sport. You still need, you know, some of these guys have uh, sports psychologists and trainers and uh, you know, weight specialists and things. So they, they get help. Uh, like when my mom passed away, I got help. I mean, I'd say, uh, as a radiologist, we like to be independent. We like to not have to ask for help, do our cases on our own. But sometimes there's a complicated case. And if you have a subspecialist, you ask them, what do you think about this case? I'd like a second opinion, uh, better than harming somebody. Well, it's the book the same way. You need help with a book cover and editing and copy editing and, and writing and, and, and marketing, uh, PR. There's just so much to it. The business end, uh, I need a good accountant. It's not just write the book, hand it in, and start collecting royalties. It's it's hours and hours of work, and uh, but don't be afraid to do it. If you have a good story, uh, I know you do as a former policeman, and, and thank you so much for your service. Uh, thank you again. Um, and same with our military and healthcare professionals, uh, frontliners. But it, all of you people have a story. And, and uh, if you have parents or grandparents or people that survived harrowing times, whether it was in Hungary or World War II or uh, Korea or Vietnam, where PTSD was really common at post Vietnam, um, write the book, write the story. And, uh, if you can get help, uh, stay with it. And even if you don't publish, you can self publish or, um, share it with friends. Uh, it, it's catharsis. It's like writing a diary, but, uh, you're doing something good by sharing a story that, that means something. So, uh, that's another lesson. And these are all lessons that come out of the book that aren't even necessarily uh, central to the book. Uh, the book uh, contains integrity, determination, uh, in, uh, it's intriguing. It's got a lot, a lot to it within the book. But the, but when you step out and you look at yourself and what you did to produce the book and why, it, there's a lot more. The, the messages are just infinite. Yeah, that's pretty. I mean, I, it had to be reading those stories uh, that you had picked up from your father and your mother, especially about your father's escaping and those kind of stories must have been uh, like um, uh, almost surreal. I, Very I would, surreal. I, I that's the perfect word. For real, yeah, and that's what drew me in, and that's what's that's why other readers are saying these great these great reviews. We're getting amazing reviews across the board. So we had uh, three wonderful testimonials from three professors: one in Israel, one in Texas, one in California. California was Michael Berenbaum, Professor Berenbaum, very known uh, in the Holocaust education circle. Hmm. I hope I get to meet him someday. Um, he is lecturing still, and I don't know how much he travels, but if I ever get to California, I would love to meet him live and in person. But he wrote a great testimonial. He uh, was the consultant uh, with Spielberg on the Shoah movie, uh, where they interviewed all, all the uh, Holocaust survivors. We're talking at least, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago. I think it was mid to late 90s that movie came out. But yeah. So he's a big name in the, in the circle, too. So 
Uh, I am networking more and more with people that uh, that are involved with this, the Holocaust education, and that's uh, that takes a while. Uh, it's another lesson that doing this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. You're not going to be you're not going to convince people overnight to, uh, to to fight to fight hate or do what they can to stop hate. But most people, fortunately, 95, 90 percent of the people are normal. And when I say normal, I mean they're not criminals. They don't want to kill their next door neighbor just because they're a different religion. Yeah. They're not fighting over territory. They're happy to have family, a job, uh, food on the table, that kind of thing. That's in, uh, maybe a little religion, maybe not the freedom to have choice. That's that's how most people are. But uh, I, I feel bad for the Iranian people and North Koreans and, and, and China in some cases, Russia even now. Uh, not much has changed with Russia with this uh, with this ongoing war. So uh, maybe they, they call themselves not a communist country, but I don't believe it. I mean, what is it? I, I, I don't believe it. I can't, you can't. You can either trust somebody or you can't, you know, or you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. Uh, it's a great line from Bush after the 911, you know, and it's, it's kind exactly. of extreme, but it's true. You know, let's, you know, pick your side. I mean. Well, Putin was arresting people just because they were laying flowers at Navalny's um in front of some some place for Navalny that they had set up, and people were laying flowers there, and they arrested them and dro drug them away to be put into an internment camp because of that. Had a um, a ballet dancer I saw on the news this morning. She is from Russia, but she has dual citizenship of the United States. She was with the ballet in Boston, um, the, whatever major ballet is is there, and uh, she. Um, gave this, I guess, the equivalent of something like thirty-five dollars to support Ukraine. They blindfolded her, showed her being blindfolded, handcuffed, and hauled away for treason because she supported Ukraine with thirty-five dollars. Can, can you? So I, I'm, well, I'm going to say one thing about that is that my mom didn't get bat mitzvah until she was well into her seventies. So oh. we'll talk about. So the Jews were not allowed to have Jewish weddings. No bat mitzvah. Yet, so there's that, uh, kind of the same thing. And didn't uh, Putin's opposition just get shot, executed? I, if I heard right, maybe I just maybe I heard. Well, he wrong. basically he had lunch and went out for a walk and collapsed. Yeah. And they won't let him. They won't let them see the body. The wife didn't get the body. They said we don't. We're not giving it up. And so they can't test it for any kind of uh, poison or drugs. But they think he might have been poisoned. Well, she, so has she been ordered? Has she been ordered to do that? that? You know, that's the thing. I mean, we don't know, and we never will know. And the poor girl that was arrested, uh, the basketball player, and she was detained yeah. for what six months, nine months, and all these people to get uh, curiously to get radiation poisoning in London or wherever. It's so uh, these these those, these are the cloak and dagger stories we're talking about. Uh, fortunately, my dad was never uh, exposed to radiation, but uh, arguing with armed Russian soldiers—that's uh, that's guts. I mean, I'd would you? I wouldn't argue with a. I'd salute the guy and. Uh, my last book talk, uh, I had two, I had great, I loved it. There was a, a security guard and a policeman and uh, the young policeman, half my age said most wet. And I'm looking at the guy, I said, you'll thank you for helping us out. And you know, we appreciate the protection. It's a sensitive subject. People are protesting down the street in Tampa. So I had to postpone one for Tampa, but I, I'll go back when they're ready. Wow. But anyway, uh, so I said, he says, well, I got to call the SWAT team. I said, oh, are you applying? Are you applying to be a, a SWAT specialist? And he goes, I already, <laughs> like, this kid can't be 22, 25 years old. But I said, I, I thanked him for his service. And it was like, uh, uh, I love seeing that. So people that support other people like that and protect them. Uh, whereas back in the day, the Nazis and the Hungarians, witnesses, cell phones, the witness was the next victim. Self lawyers, there, no, no, there's no lawyers, there's no videos and, and you know, nothing going viral. It's, you're just stuck on the Danube. Yeah. You're stuck in your in Auschwitz or your forced labor camp or on a death march. Nobody knows, and yeah. Death marches were famous in, in Asia, but not, I mean, people didn't necessarily talk about them in Europe, but they existed. Well, so, my, gr my grandparents on my, my great grandparents on my father's side um, left uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Austria, excuse me, Austria. Um, but they were Hungarian they were Hungarian living in Austria and um, they left there and immigrated here because of everything that was going on. Luckily they got here in like 19 early. I was, uh, no, 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 it was 18. Um, when did they get here? Well, the late, the end of that century, you've had a huge influx of my, uh, Italian, uh, yeah, Irish. my grandmother was, um, she actually was born, one of the first daughters born in the United States. Um, her brothers and sisters were born in uh, 
Austria at that time. And they had to sign documentation saying they renounced, you know, the Austrian king and blah, 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 blah. And, and Hungarian, you know, because they also had something to do with hung, Hungary as well. <coughs> but they didn't, they didn't experience, they we're not Jewish, so we didn't experience that from that perspective, but they wanted to get out of the war zone. They didn't want to be in that war zone. Oh, war, and, and never mind, if they're, yeah, you find out you're Jewish, or somebody's hiding you, you're Jewish, which uh, my dad had multiple, you know, or money stashed away, whatever little money that his dad might have uh, uh, saved and put away anticipating what uh, was going to happen to them. And he had to have it all by memory, nothing written down, uh, which is unbelievable. So, Well, um, that and uh, just a fear. I mean, uh, you, know, you go, imagine having to look over your shoulder constantly and, constantly, you know, uh, just not understanding everything. I'm sure that's all in the book as well is where the... Bug aspect. phones, uh, medical students that uh, converted to the communist, became communist sympathizers, Try to convince my mom and dad to go that way, and they wouldn't. They, they wouldn't. They wouldn't. They wouldn't become. And my mom used to say here too. She, she, she said, "I, I wouldn't belong to the Nazi party, and I wouldn't belong to the Communist Party. So I'm not going to belong to any American party. I vote for the best candidates." And that's exactly what she was right. So that was the. Yeah. Freedom. She nailed it. I mean, it's uh, parents Where were. Uh, and they were patriotic too, by the way. They were patriotic to Mother Hungary, not this, not this dictator type Hungary as well as uh, United States and Israel all their lives. And, and truthfully, uh, the, free, the free world. We still have cousins in Canada. We have cousins in Israel and uh, a few left. The last survivor, unfortunately, Susie, in the book, just passed away uh, in October. And uh, I got to see her when I was in Israel a few months ago, which was really nice. And she read the book and she really enjoyed it. Well, uh, cool. I was at her wedding when I was like four years old in London. So this goes way back. But her kids, she got many grandkids. They're doing well, uh, and kids and grandkids up in Canada. So small family, but uh, there's a few of us left. So I'm, you know, second cousins. I'm not, and I got to see them all within the last year, which is great. And well, which is cool. Them. Yeah, that's pretty cool. You get to get to move it forward. How did you meet your writing partner? How did you get involved with the writing partner, and what brought her to, into the fold with regard to this? And how did he she develop the passion for what she is bringing to this book? Well, it, it was lucky, lucky for me to have her because, I, and you know, it's, it, it was serendipitous really. But when I was, when I originally did the biography and I was querying and I was just hitting dead end after dead end, I decided to, to send the book to, uh, to uh, beta, beta readers. And many of them are professional uh, authors, including this lady, Lisa Tanier, uh, also Jewish. She's in Rhode Island. I hope to meet her live someday. She's done a great uh, review of the book and she's helped me with other suggestions like the book cover and uh, book award people and things like that. She's been fantastic. But what she did also uh, introduced me to Janice, Janice Harper. Uh, she's out in Washington State. Uh, she's also got a Michigan connection like me. She was a, she's a PhD, uh, and uh, she did book uh, she did articles and, and dissertations about uh, Madagascar. So she's uh, she's got her own carved her own niche, but she's a professional writer, very good. And uh, she offered to either coach me through doing the book, or she would rewrite most of the book herself and for some cost, and uh, including homework and. She really was spot on. She, her time frame was was there. Uh, she uh, she loved. She had the passion for the book, uh, like you said. Uh, she said it was the most important book that she's ever worked in, and uh, she's either co-authored or authored. I'd say at least five or ten books. You could look her up on Amazon or Janice Janice Harper. And if anybody wants book help with great advice, I highly recommend her. So, and you can get that information from me through uh, my website or uh, I'm on social media all over the place. We could talk about that, but. Uh, uh, and that's true for anything. I mean, if you want a good book cover, we have a guy, and actually the guy was Croatian, which is interesting. Uh, and, you know, Janice is out in Washington, and my publisher is in the Netherlands. Uh, and now I'm doing an, another interview, and the lady that's hosting is a, a Holocaust educator out of India. So it's we're really getting worldwide here, and, and it's really cool to have people that I've never even met help me in, in so much. And it brings me back to it's all about the team. Janice was a great addition to the team really the turning point for the book success in the end. And she Which loved doing really it. Cool. She still loves helping me. We're working on audiobooks now at the uh, bequest, uh, at the request of a lot of people. And it's a, that's a difficult process, but we're getting close. But she's helping with that yeah. too. Uh, you know, we don't, audiobooks are something that a lot of people desire too. So, so well, it's, uh, easy. it's easier. You can you can go on your commute to work and listen to an audio book. You can exactly. go on a trip, listen yeah. to an audio book. You can just it's relax exactly. at home, close your eyes and listen to an audio book. Exactly. Oh, they got a well. better Hungarian accent than me, though, because I'm. <laughs> but I'm just fooling around with you here too, so I can really work with it, English or Hungarian. But it's uh, the best I can do. Well, check it out sometime. You know, if uh, 
But now you know a little bit about the history of Hungary, or you sure, you sure will. The history is accurate, too. So not only I did my homework on the history, Janice did her homework on the history. But before we published, we had it reviewed by a, a Peter Black, who was a retired historian from the Holocaust Museum. And uh, he made a few changes. He loved the book and said, so we, put, we, we incorporated all the changes in, plus the suggestions by the three other professors that uh, had reviewed the book. So we, it's as accurate as we can get for Hungarian history for, uh, well, and, like I said, from World War I to the end of Hungarian Revolution in 56. So it covers that. It's a history. I mean, Janice gets mad. It's a history light because it's not just a history book. It's right. my dad's story, but it is a history book. It's an adventure, of course. And uh, my parents and their family's trials and triumphs and tragedies and it's amazing, and not only personally, but uh, sharing it with my friends, hearing strangers from all over the world. Uh, I've had a review from Australia. I've done a podcast out of New Zealand. I mean, it's it's so wonderful to be able to share this with people that uh, you would think they're so remote from Israel or Hungary or the United mm. States that people would be apathetic. But, you know, in the end, a lot of people care, and that's great to see. A lot of people well, the, care. Unique, the uniqueness about it is it's not fiction. It is a true story. So I think that it's a benefit to everybody that gives you the opportunity to learn and to be educated and to hopefully be motivated to help and inspired to get involved, I would hope. So Hal, tell me about how we can find your book, please. I know you got a website as well as several platforms that we can get it. Yep, my website, uh, well, I love the graphics. Very nice, uh, very pretty graphics. Uh, my, like it says, Rob, my robertjwolfmd.com. Um, I'm all over social media. You can find me on Facebook. Uh, uh, Not a Real Enemy by Robert J. Wolf is my uh, Facebook author page, or actually it's called Meta now. Uh, my, I'm also on Meta as Rob Wolf, but I'm, I'm saturated out with connections there, so I've got to vet that out. But uh, I'm also on LinkedIn uh, as Robert J. Wolf, MD. Uh, uh, let's see, X, uh, formerly Twitter, at Robert J. Wolf, MD. And I'm on Instagram at, at Robert J. Wolf, MD. We have a, a pretty good collection in our YouTube channel, so that's uh, also... Uh, Not a Real Enemy by Robert J. Wolf, MD. You can Google Not a Real Enemy, and you can Google Robert J. Wolf, MD, and you'll find me. The the, the guy who's got the half gray, half curly hair, half combed, and uh, and the book is uh, uh, available at Amazon and Barnes and Noble, uh, either brick and mortar or online. You can go into any store; it should be in their system. If they don't have it, they can get it for you. Walmart. It's on my alma mater, Tufts University bookshelves. And it's on sale so far at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in D.C. And the uh, same in uh, the Holocaust Museum in Illinois. Uh, I'm doing that talk in Houston next month. So hopefully it will be on, on the shelves there. And hopefully uh, more and more and more. You got, do you have another book in you? I have three other books in me. But three other books in you. Number one is I, right now I'm spending so much time with this one that it may be forever before I get to it. Uh, book one would be part part one or part two of the autobiography converted into a bio, which which brings him from Vienna all the way up till probably 1965 when my dad's career finally started getting going. And even then, they documented trips to Asia and how they compared the communist experience with people from China when they were in Hong Kong, things like that. But it, those that's not as exciting. Uh, part three would be uh, part autobiography and part comedy, part uh, uh, teaching didactic, which would be called The Things They Don't Teach in Med School. I shouldn't say this out loud because somebody's going to steal the title, but uh, it would be like the old humorous books about medicine, uh, The House of God, if you remember that book. So that would have a little comedy. It would have a lot of the true stories. It'd be, have a lot of encouragement to why you should go into medicine, a lot of uh, disparagement about why you shouldn't go into medicine, and then things like insurances, burnout, taxes, uh, partnership tracks, things that they don't teach in med school, uh, and even pre-med, undergrad, uh, class by class, anatomy. Some some moments I remember like it was the previous day, just like my parents. And some things uh, I don't know. You just want to forget humiliation during rounds. I mean, I, that's something that you don't even think about. Being scared that you're going to go to med school every day and you're worried. You know, you're freezing in twenty below, walking to school, and worried that uh, that you're sweating in the in conference, hoping that they don't uh, tear you apart. And it's going to happen. I mean, so it's not all pretty. So that would be the book three, and uh, part four would be how to invest in a bear market and. Uh, I'm not really a professional investor, but I've been following it, investing for 30 years. I know enough to, I know enough to know that I know more than most about what the stock market investing is about. So I could, I could sell a small book to uh, the general public about that. So, but either way, this one book by far would be the most important book that I've ever done. And uh, my original title was the Sixth Book of Moses because my dad was Moses, Moshe ben Mo Yosef, God uh, rest in peace, both of them, uh, Moses, son of, of Joseph. And uh, just uh, so because, you know, the Torah is called the five books of Moses. Uh, this could also, almost be the sixth book with all, with all the miracles. 
And then uh, the other one was the Hungarian papillon, the Hungarian butterfly. Uh, yeah. But uh, Dad's story, but uh, Dad's story was kind of un unexciting. And the papillon reference, uh, Janice said, uh, not enough people, unless you're over 50, you're not going to know yeah. what the papillon reference is. The younger people would know papillon. Famous story, Steve McQueen with Dustin Hoffman, a fantastic movie. I know they, I think they did a remake, which I never saw, but great book, great story. And But so we end up with Not a Real Enemy, and uh, people ask about why the, the title is that. And also, I'll, I'll let you guys read it, and, and you tell me, because I've given enough spoilers, I think. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, and, and I'll make sure that everything's in the show notes for, for everybody, so you can just click the link, and it'll take them right to your website, and from there they can go and explore they can see the your youtube channel i think it's got a link on there for that your blog as well as how to get the book and and all that and including your social media stuff will be on the uh, web page as well so i'll make sure that they'll have plenty in the houston area on uh, march 13th or if you're in the dc area on april 12th and 13th stop by I, if you have a copy of the book i'll be happy to sign it uh that's all i'm going to be doing in, in the dc but in houston uh, it's a book talk presentation and a signing and uh, like that's what we did in Illinois, hopefully Michigan. Uh, I, I need to call them. <laughs> I got to, I mean, my, my phone call list is this, it's huge. I mean, I need two secretaries just to do this social media and otherwise, let alone make, you know, day-to-day -day stuff, foodie stuff. Uh, I relate. Uh, I can absolutely sports, relate. Foodie stuff, golf, pickleball, weight room, fitness, nutrition. I do have other interests. I've been pretty one-sided, one-dimensional for the last year, year and change, but uh, I still do have other interests. And uh, uh, history is, is going up the ladder, too. God, family, country, and then it used to be sports, sex, and music, but now at my age, it's sports, food, and music tied for fourth. Uh, but in Florida, I don't know, I creep, it's, it fluctuates. But Fluctu money and career, lower down for me, money and career. Maybe because I was lucky enough to be a doctor and, and just make a decent living. I did nothing real fancy, fancy, but good enough. And uh, maybe I, I do take that for granted sometimes, which many Americans do, and that's another big. It sounds like you got a good career as an author that has begun. Rob, listen, this has been fantastic. Thank you very much for coming on the show. I really appreciate you sharing your journey and how you came about this book and what you have in it, what you have to share. I think is like um, treasure trove of information and education for individuals and some inspiration and motivation. I mean, your dad, in essence, was. Uh, You'd mentioned Steve McQueen earlier. The thing that popped in front of my, you know, my mind was uh, the Great Escape. Remember, he kept escaping from the the great movie, great yeah. story. Yeah, yeah, that so, was based on a real yeah Kelly's Heroes too. Or I think those are based on true stories. Based on know. true stories, yeah. So yeah, it's pretty popping in my head, and uh, you know, your dad kind of lived it or himself in that regard. So anyway. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. This is one more thing before you go. So before we go, do you have any words of wisdom you can share? Oh, I think I've spelled out a lot. But uh, for you younger, like I said, write a book. If you have a story, uh, something like this, uh, don't wait. Procrastination is a part of the business. If you do do it, be patient. Get help. Don't give up. Um, never too late to pivot. Never too late to do something else. If you're tired of being a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, go scale back to part-time. It may make your career longer, and you can uh, focus on other things like travel, and a uh, second job, writing, uh, family, wh whatever, uh, go to ball games, concerts, uh, yeah, be diversified. Uh, bo boredom is on you. I mean, if you're bored, then that's on you. I mean, that's there's, there's plenty to do out there and, and um, enjoy time because time is valuable. Time is our best commodity. It, and as you get older, you realize it's our only commodity. Um, no substitute for experience. I always tell the medical students and the residents, uh, I don't care how smart you are, there's no substitute for experience. And I've been saying that for a long time over the years. Um, uh, stock market pearls, never sell on a Monday. Uh, don't fight the ticker. Don't fight the Fed. I mean, I go on and on with all those, the cliche ones. Uh, I don't know. Well, be a team player is another good one. Be a team player. That's something uh, that you learn over time. So, well, those fun. are those are brilliant, brilliant words of wisdom. I think that enjoy every it. moment. My dad used to say, <laughs> "Enjoy every moment." Enjoy every moment should be uh, emblazoned upon our our computer screens you can't see my hands moving computer screens up here and as a reminder don't sit in front of the screen too long enjoy every moment get out and move around but brilliant words of wisdom again i'll make sure that everything is in the show notes and on the web page uh for one, before you go podcast.com that will connect with you so they can come to find the book as well as many 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 other little tidbits of um connecting with you and Thank you again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Michael. I appreciate it. It was a really well-spent uh, time and, and appreciate the opportunity to talk with you.
Pleasure but, meeting you. Thank you very much. For everyone else out there, please like, subscribe, and follow. And uh, one more thing before you all go, have a great day, have a great week, and thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of One More Thing Before You Go. Check out our website at beforeyougopodcast.com. You can find us as well as subscribe to the program and rate us on your favorite podcast listening platform.